Hello and welcome to part two of this lecture. If you're in my course and viewing this video lecture through Moodle, then you've already answered this question. And at least you know whether your answer was correct or not, though you may not yet know what the correct answer is. If you're not in my course and you haven't answered this question yet, then you should really go back to the first part of this video lecture and answer it. Now what we're going to do is answer this question by directly analyzing the velocity vectors straight from the data. So here is the video analysis of the trajectory of the falling object blown up nice and big so you can see what's going on and I'm going to use the velocity from 10 to 11 and the average velocity from 11 to 12 to estimate the direction of the acceleration at time 11. And so here are those vectors scaled up nice and big so that you can see the vector subtraction in detail and we'll use them to get the acceleration that we want. So just as before, I'll take the negative of vi and add it to vf and that gives me my change in velocity vector and it points straight down. And so that means the acceleration at time 11 points straight down. And if I were to repeat that for all of the other times, I find that it's straight down at every time I look at. And what's more, I find that those acceleration vectors are all the same size. So of the options I provided you in the question, the correct one is C. If you chose A or B, you're probably mixing up acceleration with velocity. If you chose D, well, that may also be because of mixing up acceleration with velocity. You may be thinking that just because the thing is getting faster, the acceleration must be bigger. But remember, the acceleration is the rate of change in velocity. It's not really all that connected with how big the velocity is. So let's understand this result in terms of some things that we've seen earlier in the course. Remember that in the cart frame, an observer sees this object move straight down, and what's more, they see it move straight down speeding up. And so for them, the acceleration points straight down. But all inertial observers always agree on measurements of accelerations, and so the person in the earth frame has to get the same result. The acceleration is straight down. We can also see, if we look at the y component of velocity in the cart frame, that it gives a nice straight line graph, and so that tells us that the acceleration is constant. Similarly, in the, in the Earth frame, if we just look at the y component of the velocity versus time, we also see a straight line curve. And so both agree that the acceleration is constant. But there's another way to understand it that's probably easier. Think of the free body diagram of the object after it's released. It's not touching anything, and it's not moving that fast, so air drag can't be very important, and so the only force acting on it is a gravitational force due to the Earth. And that points down, and so the vector sum of forces is down, and the acceleration must be down. What's more, we know that this is free fall, and so the acceleration should be straight down and have a constant magnitude equal to g. We already know a lot about how to analyze motions in one dimension. Motions in two dimensions look more complicated, but as we're going to see, we can approach analyzing them just by thinking of them as two one-dimensional motions going on simultaneously. The only trick we need for that is decomposition of the vectors. And we've already conceptually seen how to do that. We'll see more details about how to do it in another couple of video lectures. But let me just review what it means. If we have some vector a, then we can drop perpendiculars from a onto our axes and draw vectors along them. And those two vectors add up to a and we call them the component vectors. And the magnitudes of the component vectors are the components of the vector. That's all we mean by vector decomposition, breaking it into its component vectors. To start to see how we think of a 2D motion as two 1D motions, let's return to this falling object. And one way of thinking of vector decomposition is that we are projecting the vectors onto the x and y axes. So here are those two velocity vectors projected onto the x and y axes, which give us the x and y component vectors. 
and we can similarly project the acceleration vectors onto the axes. In this particular case, the acceleration is parallel to the y-axis, and so its x component is zero, but more generally, we'll end up with x and y components of the acceleration. Now you can see, looking here, how this looks like a nice 1D motion with an acceleration in the direction of motion, and thus it's speeding up. And this looks like a nice 1D zero acceleration motion. And we can now think of this motion as being made out of these two motions going on at the same time. And we've reduced the problem of thinking about a 2D motion to the problem of thinking about two 1D motions. And we can similarly decompose the forces, momentums, and any other vector we want. And so all of the methods we've learned earlier in the course to think about 1D motions, we can still use with the one detail that's new, which is that we have to work with the X and the Y components separately. Another thing about this, as we're about to see, is that we don't always have to decompose all of the vectors into components parallel to the axes. Sometimes there are other decompositions that give us useful insights into the motion. But now let's use this idea of decomposing vectors to think about the meaning of accelerations that point at various angles to our velocity vector, because in the previous part of this lecture we saw how our acceleration can point in various directions relative to the velocity. So here's some trajectory of an object, and at some time I'm saying it's got the velocity and acceleration vectors shown, where notice that the velocity is tangent to the trajectory as it has to be we can use a particularly useful decomposition of the acceleration. We can decompose it into a component parallel to the velocity and a component perpendicular to the velocity. And these two components have very specific meaning. Remember that in one dimension, if the acceleration was in the direction of the motion, then the object was speeding up. And if it was opposite the direction of motion, then the object was slowing down. Well, if we only have a parallel component of the acceleration, we're back in that situation. And so we know that if the parallel component of the acceleration is in the same direction as the velocity, then the object must be speeding up. And if it's in the opposite direction as the velocity, then it must be slowing down. What's left over is the perpendicular component of the acceleration. And if that's non-zero, then that means the velocity is changing direction. And so we can look at a case like this, where the acceleration is um, opposite the direction of the velocity and to the side. And in this case, we would see that this object must be slowing down because the parallel component of the acceleration is opposite the velocity. And the trajectory also must be curving up in this case. Whereas in this case, this object must be speeding up and its trajectory must be curving to the right. We can analyze any two-dimensional motion using these ideas, but there are a couple of special cases we'll pay particular attention to. One of them is the case of a projectile, which is just an object moving only under the influence of gravity. So when you throw a ball, that's a projectile, as long as air drag is negligible. Well, we've already seen this case because that's what our object that we dropped from the moving cart was. And we know that the only force acting on it was gravity. And that resulted in an acceleration down. So that's the key feature of projectile motion, a constant acceleration down. And the outcome of that is that the horizontal component of the motion is a constant velocity motion whereas the vertical component is uniformly accelerated motion, which we're very familiar with from an earlier part of the course. And so we have lots of ways to analyze motions like this. Another case we'll look at in some detail is uniform circular motion. And what I mean by uniform circular motion is that we have an object that's moving in a circle and it's moving with a constant speed. Well, we already know from earlier in the lecture that when an object goes around a corner at constant speed, the acceleration vector points perpendicular to the velocity, when the velocity, remember, is pointing tangent to the trajectory. In the case of a circle, that means that the acceleration points directly to the center of the circle. Notice something about uniform circular motion that often confuses people. 
neither the acceleration nor the velocity is constant. You may now be shaking your head in confusion, because I just said this is motion with constant speed. Yes, I did. Constant speed, not constant velocity. The velocity is constantly changing its direction, and so it's changing, even though the speed, which is its magnitude, is staying constant. And the same goes for the acceleration. The acceleration's magnitude is constant in uniform circular motion, but the acceleration has to constantly change direction if it's going to remain pointing to the center of the circle. A final special case that we'll spend some time on is non-uniform circular motion, which just means circular motion with a changing speed. So here's a motion diagram for circular motion where this object is speeding up as it goes around the circle, and we can find the acceleration as usual at one point by just carrying out the usual vector subtraction. And we see that the acceleration vector still points inward, but not directly towards the center of the circle. In this case, because the object is speeding up, as we already know, there has to be a component of the acceleration that points forward. And there still has to be an inward component because for the trajectory to be curved, there has to be a component of the acceleration that points to the inside of the curve.